please go forth. What's up, everybody? Thank you for coming. I hope you are having a great uh, first day of the Spinnaker Summit. Can we get a round of applause if everybody has uh, enjoyed their time so far? Sweet. Uh, as Daniel said, I'm Ethan Rogers. I'm from Armory. I'm uh, joined by my co-leads for the Kubernetes SIG, uh, Eric and Maggie. Um, and what we wanted to do uh, today is just give you like an overview of where we've come over the last year as far as uh, Kubernetes goes within Spinnaker. So just before, before we kind of dive in, just to give an overview of where we're at. So first, we're going to just talk a little bit about the history um, of, of Kubernetes within Spinnaker. I'm sure a lot of you have kind of read and heard uh, about the V2 provider and the problems that it solved. So we just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a history lesson. Then we're going to talk about um, some features and performance improvements that we've made. We've come kind of a long way um, in the last year with just how well Kubernetes interacts uh, and fits into the Spinnaker ecosystem. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll talk about the future, um, where we want to go. And on, in a large part, you, the community, are what actually help us drive this. So if you hear anything in that slide or you see anything that may be missing, come up and tell us after, afterwards. We'd love to hear it. Then we're going to talk a little bit about our SIG, which is our kind of community gathering space that we've been running for the last year. Um, and we have a really good attendance. Um, and yeah, so we're just going to talk a little bit about that. And then one thing that we love to do at the end of every SIG meeting is a uh, open discussion. So this is just going to give you guys a chance to ask questions, to uh, let us know what you think about Kubernetes within Spinnaker and how we can make it better. So how did we get here? Let's uh, dive into the Wayback Machine um, and take a look at where we came from. So. Uh, Kubernetes, well, Spinnaker, uh, the V1 provider, was introduced in uh, late 2015. Um, this is what we call the kind of first iteration of Kubernetes within Spinnaker. It was modeled very closely to the VM-based providers within uh, Spinnaker. So GCP, AWS, all of those other cloud providers that were already there, uh, we basically took Kubernetes and said, how can we map the concepts of Kubernetes to all of these things. So what we did was we abstracted a lot of the common cloud concepts that were standard across providers, like auto-scale groups or some type of um, uh, capacity scaling and stuff like that. We had uh, server groups, security groups, and load balancers. And we wanted it to um, basically perform the same function as EC2 and GCE. We wanted to take take a workload and place it on some infrastructure running somewhere. Like That is essentially what Kubernetes is doing. If you think about Kubernetes and what it does for your small cluster, and then you scale it out, you get what all of the major cloud providers do, like EC2 and GCP. So we take workloads and we, take, and we uh, place it on infrastructure. Um, and one of the big benefits of being modeled after VM-based providers is you could create a server group in GCE, AWS, Kubernetes, and it would all feel similar, right? The abstractions aren't exactly the same. Some of the um, details and implementation details of each individual cloud provider leaked out, but when you could configure a server group in AWS, you kind of had similar uh, configurations for Kubernetes, and that was a big plus. Um, you can see here, this is the, the wizard for creating a, a, a service, uh, which is analogous to a load balancer. We had a configuration wizard for deploying a replica set um, or a deployment, depending on what you wanted. Uh, but I guess the point that I'm trying to make with these pictures is everything was very GUI based. Um, one of the challenges we had was we had kind of this interim data model where you would configure these things in like Spinnaker land and they kind of mapped to all of the options in like a Kubernetes deployment, but they weren't perfect. Um, and then we started getting a lot of questions. Like where's the YAML, right? Everybody who's done Kubernetes is, is loves YAML. Uh, it's kind of made its resurgence and um, become very prominent in our industry, um, especially within Kubernetes. And so. We wanted to address that, right? We wanted to more closely align with the Kubernetes community, how they interact, interacted with Kubernetes, and really wanted to be able to adopt the tools that they were using. So within uh, a couple years, the V2 provider was introduced in 2018. 
Um, I believe at the uh, last Spinnaker Summit, we were really starting to talk about it and really starting to use it with a lot of, uh, a lot of customers. And so that introduced a lot of new features. Uh, we had this concept of artifacts. Kubernetes is very manifest based. It's very, you know, the idea of storing your uh, manifest in source control is like a first class citizen within Kubernetes and other tooling. So we wanted to be able to support that. Um, but we also had, we also still needed to map the concepts to uh, Spinnaker abstractions, right? There's, everything is pretty similar for auto scale groups, our replica sets, services, or load balancers, and stuff like that. So we continued to do that. Um, and we kind of started doing this thing where we would just meet every few weeks and talk about how the development was going. And this is really what kind of kicked off the Kubernetes SIG. So we call it the Kubernetes V2 developer meeting. And then over time, we transitioned into just a general Kubernetes meeting. And it's gone really well. Um, and I believe we might have switched the order of this. So I have a note hand off to Eric. But I will actually hand off to Maggie to talk about features that we've added. Thank you, Ethan. Um, so as Ethan mentioned, the V2 provider, instead of having you know, a similar wizard um, to the VM-based providers, just kind of exposes input for you to input YAML that represents whatever resources you need. And so some of our feature work this year just centered around enhancing those to really add value above and beyond if you could just cube control apply those resources yourself. Um, so a bunch of these take place in the manifest deployment stages. So a common complaint we got from members of the SIG was that it didn't necessarily um, play super nicely with Helm, where you can override a namespace. So we built first class support for that in Spinnaker. Um, another issue that Helm users were running into was Spinnaker uses spring expression language. And so unfortunately, um, having curly brace dollar sign in your Helm templates wouldn't play nicely there. So we allow you to kind of override the default error behavior if Spinnaker can't um, evaluate those expressions. And then finally, one really cool value add that these kind of cube control apply analogous stages give you um, is the ability to dynamically target a different resource in Kubernetes to do the operation to. So for example, if you wanted to patch or delete a certain resource, you can input into Spinnaker, I want to do this to the largest one, the second newest one, et cetera. And so that really kind of unlocks some workflows that would be pretty difficult to like orchestrate yourself through um, a script. And another way we kind of sought to add value over the built-in deployment object in Kubernetes, which doesn't really give you a great way to do a blue-green, is by having Spinnaker manage that for you. Um, so something that's kind of hard to do in Kubernetes is manipulate labels to direct traffic yourself for some kind of a complex rollout. And so we decided to build first-class support for that into the deploy manifest stage um, so that you can kind of have Spinnaker take care of what it means to associate a service with a workload and how you want to direct traffic and should it be on right away and what should I do with the previous version of that workload once the new one is safely taking a traffic. And so this diagram just kind of shows a matrix of the strategies available to you. Um, some of those terms probably look familiar from Netflix. So a red black is analogous to a blue green. And then a Highlander is similar with the addition that if you know, you're kind of working under resource constraints and you want to immediately destroy the old version, Spinnaker can go ahead and take care of that for you. I'm going to pass it back to Ethan for some more feature talk. Yeah. So. Um, to kind of like keep with the, the theme of being able to adopt Kubernetes tools, one of the things that we saw new users of Spinnaker coming in was they wanted to be able to use things like Helm uh, to keep generating their manifests, right? I think a lot of people in here are probably uh, praising the release of Helm 3 and its remover of Tiller. Uh, but this is actually not a problem that we've been uh, dealing with since we introduced the big manifest stage because we purely use it as a templating engine. Um, so. We've, added, we've had support for Helm ever since we, we introduced this. We recently added support for Customize um, and a new Git repo artifact type. So if you've been tracking the development of some of this stuff, um, you'll know that we introduced the Git repo artifact type to help aid in our ability to use Customize as a template renderer. Um, there's a lot of really interesting um, templating tools and, and uh, manifest generation tools that will probably benefit from this Git repo artifact provider as well. Um, if you've heard of Captain, it's uh, pretty similar to Customize. So we're looking at doing that and integrating that as well. Um, next, a, something that a lot of really big organizations have been excited about is this concept of dynamic accounts. 
Um, this is actually something that I and uh, Pivotal have both worked on. I don't know if Scott Frederick is in here, but um, he introduced the first iteration of uh, cloud config to, to CloudDriver. What does this enable? Um, I think as Kubernetes has started to take a foothold in many organizations, we're seeing customers that have hundreds, uh, upwards of high hundreds of accounts. Um, and what they're doing is they're actually just creating new Kubernetes clusters for every team that onboards, maybe every application. And if you're familiar with uh, how Spinnaker's accounts are configured, you know that it's challenging to roll out new accounts. Um, and in this like automated world that we have, where you can automate creating a new Kubernetes cluster, adding it to your config manually is kind of a bummer. Um, and so dynamic accounts really enables us to, to go the next step. How do, we, how do we make Spinnaker configurable without ever having to take it down or do a redeploy? So dynamic accounts and further like dynamic configuration uh, really is going to help push us to that next level. Um, and so with that, talking about ag scaling farther out into this world where we have hundreds and thousands of clusters, I'd like to hand it over to Eric, um, who's going to talk a lot about the performance improvement set we've made over the last year. Great. So as Ethan said, um, one of the big focuses in the Kubernetes space over the last year was improving the performance of the Kubernetes provider um, when dealing with large clusters, many accounts. Um, I don't know if any of you who've operated Spinnaker have heard of CloudDriver, if you've ever seen it on your metrics dashboards or anything like that. Um, if you haven't, I'm going to introduce it for you in the next slide. Um, so I guess before I talk in a little bit of detail about some of the improvements that we made, I'll briefly go over kind of what the caching architecture is that is behind Spinnaker. And a lot of this base caching architecture is the same across various providers, but I'll talk about it specifically in the context of the Kubernetes v2 provider. Um, so Spinnaker is continuously polling all of, your all of your infrastructure to kind of build its state of the world. So it's, I think it's configurable, but it's every minute or two minutes kind of polling and saying, okay, tell me everything that you know about all the infrastructure um, that is deployed. And then it's storing all of that in its cache, which historically was only Redis. Now there's the option to use SQL. Um, I know a lot of people have started moving over to SQL um, because it is really a better fit for the relational model um, of the data that's being stored there and has better performance characteristics. Um, but obviously, there's still a lot of Redis usage out there as well. Um, and a lot of the memory and CPU usage of CloudDriver comes from these caching agents that are doing all this work to figure out how the, what the state of the world is. And so in the case of Kubernetes, that's actually just doing cube control list on um, all of the clusters that you have configured. For other providers, it's kind of hitting whatever API is relevant for understanding what's deployed there. Um, and I guess one slight comment is, you know, right now we're doing this via shelling out to kube control list. We have thought about kind of maybe it's better to use a client library for that. Um, I think at the time that the V2 provider was written, um, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't exposed through the client library. Kind of there's a lot of logic built into kube control, which is slowly kind of getting better. Um, so that is something that we could think about in the future, um, moving stuff, moving away from just shelling out to kube control and using the client library. Um, and so then when we have another microservice that wants to know something about what you have deployed, instead of going directly talking to your cluster, it asks CloudDriver, um, which then asks the cache kind of what's going on with this particular deployment. So as an example, um, if Orca is in the middle of a pipeline and wants to know, hey, is this replica set that I've just deployed stable and ready for use, then Orca is going to ask CloudDriver, who's going to look in the cache and return that data. And similarly, if you want to load your clusters tab in DEC, DEC, of course, only talks to Gate, but then Gate will ask CloudDriver, and same thing, it'll look in the cache. Um, I guess there's one exception here, um, is that if live manifest mode is on, um, some of you may have enabled that for performance reasons in the past. Um, if you haven't enabled it, um, don't. We, we think that we fixed all those performance issues. Um, I won't tell you how. Um, and if you know how, don't tell anyone else here. Um, and, um, but if that's on, then actually um, CloudDriver just directly queries the cluster um, when it's doing a deployment so you don't have to wait for the cache to update. Um, 
And so what happens if caching is inefficient? Um, so the first thing that happens is that you get really high CPU and memory usage of CloudDriver. Um, so this is an actual graph of CloudDriver memory usage um, if you have a lot of uh, stuff deployed to your cluster. Um, funny story is actually like every, every emoji has kind of a Unicode code point. If you look at the description of this one, it's actually CloudDriver memory usage, which is how I found it. Um, and then the second thing that can happen is that you can end up with pipeline deploys timing out because they're waiting for um, something to show up in the cache, but the cache is refreshing so slowly that it never actually shows up there in time. So um, some of you may or may not have seen this issue where you're waiting for uh, or forced cache refresh, that's right. If you've ever seen a forced cache refresh stage take exactly 12 minutes, um, might be that your cache is not updating fast enough. So I wanted to actually do a demo of waiting 12 minutes with a forced cache refresh, but um, my section is only 12 minutes, so I figured I'd probably like want some other slides too. Um, and so with that context, um, this is just kind of the end result. I won't obviously go into all of the kind of performance improvements that went into there, but um, after kind of a lot of months of work, um, this is just the um, total number of, yeah, this is number of allocated objects by the JVM during a caching cycle of CloudDriver. Um, so you see we've gone from, in this particular example, I forget how many accounts I had configured and how much was in those accounts, but it was a lot. Um, we've gone from 133 million to 37 million objects. That's basically like a factor of roughly three to four X uh, reduction in object allocations, which just really reduces the pressure on the JVM. Um, and this eliminated one bug where I think some users were seeing just CloudDriver dying with the uh, garbage collection overhead exceeded, which is what happens when Java just can't keep up with the number of objects you're creating. Um, and then also um, contributed just for people who were still able to run it, just reducing that CPU usage so that maybe you don't need like a 450 CPU core machine to run CloudDriver. So divide that by like three now and that's what you need. Um, so there's still a bit of work to do. Um, as kind of a sort of a, a, uh, a different axis of work that we did in the cloud driver um, performance and resiliency space um, is looking at what happens, um, looking at kind of reducing startup time and increasing the resiliency towards having um, Kubernetes clusters that are unreachable. So I think one thing that's very common with the Kubernetes provider that wasn't as common with other providers is that you're very frequently adding and removing clusters. As teams onboard clusters, teams remove them. Um, and so you pretty frequently end up with a situation where maybe your CloudDriver config has a cluster still in there that you turn down and haven't removed from your CloudDriver config anymore. Or maybe it is a cluster that should be there, but for some reason it's unreachable due to kind of some network partition or something like that. Um, and so before some recent changes, Startup would basically block waiting, trying to talk to that cluster. It would eventually time out, but I think it would take something like 15 or 20 minutes just trying to communicate with that cluster before it finally timed out. Um, and then if the cluster went down while Spinnaker was already up, you would see a lot of degraded performance because there were a number of workflows that kind of depended on talking to all of the available clusters. Um, so in order to help both of those problems, um, what we did was, um, actually I should mention one specific thing that we do on startup. So the reason this was taking a long time on startup is that um, on startup we were trying to understand what permission Spinnaker was running as so that we could fail fast right away if Spinnaker didn't have permission to list deployments, list network policies in a particular cluster, we would just mark that as not something Spinnaker has permission to do and then stop trying as opposed to just throwing errors throughout um, the entire lifetime of the process. Um, so that was kind of what was causing startups to take a long time, um, both in the case of an unreachable cluster and also just in the case where you had a lot of accounts because that's just a lot of work to do on startup to go talk to every single cluster that you have and try to figure out what Kubernetes kinds are readable. Um, so to help both of those problems, um, we moved this permission querying out of the single threaded startup loop and kind of deferred that to on demand. So we still only check everything once, but we do it on demand the first time it's needed, which frees up that startup thread so that things start up a lot faster. Um, and that also pushes errors down to only affecting the particular cluster that's unreachable or that has issues. Um, so now, um, as this um, 
log line, here's kind of a boring image. It's just a log line from the cloud driver logs. But if you've seen that line, say like 47 minutes to start up cloud driver, this is probably going to be pretty exciting. Um, if you haven't seen that yet, yeah, it's just a boring line of, uh, line of text there. Um, so startup is much faster. And also now, if one of your clusters is unreachable, um, it will only affect that cluster. You can still deploy, do everything else with all of the other clusters. You'll see errors in the logs for that particular cluster, but it won't affect your other workflows. You won't see uh, DEX starting, you know, just spinning forever because it's timing out. Um, and so I guess in summary for this section, um, you know, these performance improvements have helped us you know, allow the Kubernetes V2 provider to scale to much larger installations. So I guess along two axes, number one, um, just number of accounts that you have configured, and number two, just amount of stuff you have deployed in each account. So um, obviously, still some more work to do in this space. Definitely interested to hear anyone's continued performance problems and work with you on them. But at least at this point, we've unblocked kind of some more headspace in terms of being able to deploy, uh, be able to manage larger clusters and more clusters with the Kubernetes V2 provider. Um, and so with that, I will pass it over to Maggie to talk a little bit about kind of what our plans are um, for the coming year. Thank you, Eric. All right, so a lot of our future work is kind of centered around the problems of how should users manage the complexity of using Kubernetes with Spinnaker, um, to what extent should Spinnaker teach Kubernetes to beginning users of both Spinnaker and Kubernetes, and kind of what is the right level of abstraction to expose um, in Spinnaker. And so as Ethan kind of went over, the V1 provider mimicked the wizard-based model of the more VM-based providers and sort of exposed a similar level of abstraction. Um, we kind of figured out that, you know, wasn't the right answer as people move towards more of a, a GitOps workflow. And instead, we kind of exposed input for representation of any Kubernetes resources you wanted, um, which I think we're discovering to an extent did potentially leave some people who are just getting started with Kubernetes or who maybe just kind of want to get a proof of concept set up behind. And so I think one area of our future work will be investigating, you know, is there kind of an easier level of abstraction to expose in the V2 provider kind of alongside the more GitOps workflow for that subset of users. Um, another area of work, I'm um, sure many of y'all heard the Netflix talk on their new effort towards managed delivery. Uh, I think something we'd love to see is kind of convergence on what that type of spec would look like for Kubernetes. So that's another thread of work. Yeah, and then I think finally, um, along the line of exposing, you know, Kubernetes specific complexity to Spinnaker users, right now there are some resources that are common to many Kubernetes workflows that aren't necessarily exposed in the UI. Um, Spinnaker kind of has its own concept of, you know, clusters and load balancers and firewalls being sort of the only things that matter. And what we're finding as we talk to more Kubernetes users is that's just not necessarily true. Um, and so kind of deciding which Kubernetes only resources to expose, how to expose them, how to potentially adjust the naming um, to just be less confusing for people who are kind of only coming to Spinnaker to use Kubernetes. Um, and with that, if any of this sounds interesting to you, um, both the future work and any of the previous work we mentioned that are ongoing efforts, we would just absolutely love to have you at the SIG. Um, it's definitely my favorite hour of the week. So we meet every other week. Um, it kind of feels like everyone is in the same room, even though it's over Hangout. Um, it was really great to meet a lot of the recurring SIG members today at the summit. Um, please come, even if you aren't yet using, you know, Spinnaker and Kubernetes, or if you're still using the V1 provider, or if you're just evaluating, or if you're a power user, um, and whether you're on a central team or an end user, we would just absolutely love to have you. Um, so with that, just a few of the logos of companies that regularly attend, um, and this is just a subset. Often we have, you know, 25 to 30 people on the call. Um, so please come, and I will just pass it off to Eric for a little more info on like what you could possibly bring to the SIG. Great, so um, if you do come to the SIG, which we hope you do, um, just kind of some thoughts about questions, ideas that you can bring. So I think one of the things that uh, we really like to hear is things that Spinnaker, or the Kubernetes V2 provider, didn't quite solve for you. Um, things that we should think about in terms of adding features or closing gaps, or honestly, maybe something that's just a bug that we thought was actually working properly. Um, and I think one really important uh, point about that is we want to hear about it even if it's something that you managed to find a workaround to solve. Because um, I know a lot of you and a lot of the people that attend the SIG um, are 
operators of Spinnaker at your company and maybe your kind of the dev tools platform team, I think there's a million different names for it, um, and you have kind of customers or users at your company that bring things to you and sometimes you find kind of some workaround that works for you um, and so that might just solve the problem and you could forget about it there. Um, but if, you know, in thinking about that problem with your user, you think, hey, there'd be a way for Spinnaker to solve this problem better or I really don't like the workaround that I had to do for this. Um, I'll close my eyes and just kind of do it. Please bring it to the stake so we can talk about that and think about whether that's a reasonable problem for Spinnaker to solve so you don't need your workaround anymore. Um, and a couple of examples of that. These are pretty small examples, but um, good examples of people bringing problems to the SIG and us kind of talking together about what a good solution would be. Um, first one is uh, spell evaluation interacting poorly with Helm manifest. So Maggie talked about that a little bit earlier. That just came out of someone bringing that problem to the SIG. And there were workarounds that involved a lot, a lot of backslashes, um, more like more backslashes than you've ever seen. Um, but we brought, you know, we talked about that at the SIG um, and eventually came up with what is, I think, a much better solution. Um, and the second solution is having an override namespace option in the deploy manifest stage. Um, I think originally we didn't have that because the point was that you should just include the namespace in your manifest. Um, but I think what we learned from talking to people in the SIG is that a lot of people were using Spinnaker to deploy Helm charts, and Helm charts often don't specify the namespace. Um, so unless there was some way for you to override that using Spinnaker, it was just ending up in the default namespace. So kind of after some discussions at the SIG, um, we added this, this option here. Um, another thing, this is kind of a little bit of an offshoot of the SIG, but um, we've started trying to be much better about triaging incoming GitHub issues um, to the project. So I um, think if you've reported GitHub issue in the past, you may or may not have encountered Spinnaker bot who shows up after 45 days, marks the issue stale, and then shows up after 45 more days and closes it. Um, we really want to reduce the number of cases of that happening because that's really not a great experience. Um, and so what we started doing, um, Maggie, Ethan, and I, and I, every couple of weeks, just going through and reading through every issue that is related to Kubernetes that gets reported um, in the Spinnaker, Spinnaker repo, triaging those um, into you know, ones that we should fix, ones we should close, and um, I guess the tie back to the SIG is there's a class of those that um, we bring to the SIG for further discussion. Um, so look to see us kind of commenting and bring these things up. If you feel there's an issue that's not getting attention, please bring it to the SIG. Um, we can talk about it there as well. Um, and then one other point that I'll plug is, um, a subset of the ones that we look at the issue and say, hey, this is a bug, we should fix it. Um, obviously, the three of us don't necessarily have bandwidth to fix all of these issues. Um, so we've started tagging things beginner friendly if we think that it's something that's accessible for a new contributor to do. Um, so these are ones that are pre-vetted as, hey, we've looked at this, we think this is a valid issue that should be fixed, um, and we think it's something to be a good first or second issue. Um, so please, if you are interested in contributing, um, that's a great place to find some, some places to contribute. Um, and I think with that, um, just want to thank everyone for listening, and um, we'll use whatever time we have left for questions. All right, a quick announcement before we start with questions. If you could all go onto the Spinnaker Summit app by Modev and rate and give feedback for the talk, that would be greatly appreciated. Now, if anybody has questions, please raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, you mentioned the dynamic account configuration that's there. Is that specifically for Kubernetes itself as the provider or Spinnaker in general? Um, so it has only been introduced to support Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry. Um, the implementation, though, could possibly lend itself to like other cloud providers as well. So um, we haven't really had too much interest from any of the other kinds of providers like AWS or, I don't know, have you guys heard it for Google Cloud? No? Um, so if, I mean, if somebody wanted to go in and do that, it could, they could certainly do that. Hey, so uh, we use V1 and that force cache refresh issue happens all the time. Um, so are those caching improvements happening to uh, the V1 provider as well? 
Uh, no, so the, all the improvements that have happened over the last year are V2, and we're really focusing more on V2 um, to try to kind of pull those improvements there. Um, I think one thing we'd love to talk to you about is kind of why you're using V1 and kind of what a migration path would be to V2. And we realize like they're pretty different, and so the idea is not like, hey, let's just like convince everyone to move over. But like, I guess to phrase it another way, like, what would we need to add to V2 in order to convince you to move over to V2? Um, I think we're convinced that like. It it's a better path forward. However, we're so ingrained, like uh, we have a, kind of a snowflakey, hacky way of generating our pipeline JSON. Um, we, we've been on Spinnaker for a few years and you know V1 was just there. So now it's a non-zero amount of work to migrate, so. Yeah, and I guess phrase another way, like what could we do to make that migration easier as well? Uh, you know, obviously I don't think it will ever be a zero effort migration, but maybe we can help make that easier than asking you to rewrite all your pipelines, um, I think. I'll take away the maybe there. I think we can make it easier than asking to rewrite all your pipelines. So definitely something I would love to talk about. Thank you. Uh, I heard you mentioned about the Captain. I think it was Captain. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like one of the first few slides. Can you say a bit more? Is it already? A backlog item for you. What what do you think about it? Why and all that? Yeah. So I have let's see, like a month ago, I talked with the uh, creator or two of the creators of Captain, um, and they they were interested in adding it. They're also interested in figuring out how you could use it to do like pipeline generation. I think one of their goals with that project is to be this like ubiquitous tool that can be used in a lot of different areas. Um, it's not something that's on either of our team's backlogs, um, but the creator said that he was interested in contributing. So um, is that, if it's something that you're like interested in, I think there might be a GitHub issue uh, for it. Um, if there's not, we could create one and start tracking interest there. And we, we could talk more about that afterward. No more questions? All right. We'll start on it soon. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different question, I swear. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a request for a clarification. You put up a slide about blue-green deployments in the V2 provider, I think, or was it red-black, but whatever? Yes, V2. Th those it's also uh, in V1. Yeah. Um, th am I right that those only work on replica sets, or do they work on deployments, too? You are correct. So if you want to use a built-in rollout strategy that Kubernetes gives you with a deployment, we would recommend continuing to use a deployment. And if you would like Spinnaker to manage your rollout, which it's going to do by managing the labels of the replica sets, you do need to use a replica set because if Spinnaker were to try to edit the labels on the deployment, it would change its spec and trigger another rollout. So you kind of do need to decide based on your needs which resource to use. All right, the, the whole tr changing labels on the deployment and pausing the deployment it would be really exciting if Spinnaker <laughs> knew how to do that too. Thanks. Any other hands? Hi. How might um, red black deployments work with something in conjunction with Istio? That's a really good question. So we have support for Istio and Spinnaker in Spinnaker so far as if you had your own YAML for Istio and wanted to basically do the equivalent of running Kube Control apply on it, but with a Spinnaker stage and basically manage it yourself, that is available, but it's not integrated in a first class way. So I would not recommend um, using Istio as a service mesh and then also having a Spinnaker managed rollout strategy because you kind of, like, if you are opting into Istio, I would guess that you kind of need to hand control over like traffic routing completely to Istio. Um, so. Yeah, I think that those would have to be two separate pads, but it is something that we've talked about at the SID, like what would first class support for Istio look like in Spinnaker? What user stories would we be trying to solve for if there was a first class integration? So we'd love to hear your thoughts um, at the SIG. Yeah, 
Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much.